Welcome, and thank you for tuning in to this afternoon's panel as part of the Word on the Street Toronto 2021 Festival, our 32nd annual and second fully virtual. I'm Maya, your host, and we're excited to be presenting So Funny It Hurts, Memoirs of Grief and Resilience, a discussion on three new memoirs presented in partnership with The Walrus. Our accessibility sponsor for this event is ECW Press. Before we dive into our discussion, we need to recognize the land we occupy. The Toronto of today exists because of the Toronto Purchase, also known as Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation in 1805, with a final claim settlement in 2010. Watts Toronto also recognizes the history of the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Seneca Nations in this te territory. The place in which Watts operates is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to care for and share the resources around the Great Lakes in peace. Toronto, or Tikaranto, is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples with long histories on this land, and acknowledging this is only the first step in building a practice of land stewardship and Indigenous solidarity that honours these peoples. We encourage you to educate yourself about the land you occupy, wherever you're tuning in from. And just a few announcements before we introduce today's panellists. Don't forget to sign up for our upcoming panels. This is day nine of our, day, our, of our 10 day festival, celebrating storytelling, ideas, and imagination. This evening, we will be joined by Eden Robinson to discuss her newest book, Return of the Trickster with Lisa Bird Wilson. Following that, Andre Alexis will be here to chat about his new book, Ring with Jose Teodoro. All information about our upcoming panels can be found on our website, toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca. If you wanna be the first to know about new videos from The Word on the Street Toronto, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can find all the panels from this year's festival. And if you enjoyed today's talk, please give this video a like to help others find it as well. And now I'm very pleased to welcome our moderator for this panel, Jessica Johnson. Jessica is editor in chief and creative director of The Walrus, Canada's leading general interest magazine. She is the former books editor of Saturday Night and National Post, and a former reporter and editor at The Globe and Mail. A National Magazine award-winning writer, she has contributed essays and criticism to a range of publications in Canada and the U.S. Thanks for joining us this, this afternoon, Jessica. It's very good to have you here. Thank you, Maya. I'm very excited to introduce our panelists, um, all of whom are fabulous and interesting Canadian arts personalities. First of all, Catherine Bradbury is a leader and top editor of major Canadian news organizations and publications. She's worked at the Globe and Mail, Metro News, where she was editor-in-chief, and Maclean's Magazine, and is now senior news director at CBC News. Catherine lives in Toronto. Ralph Bemergi is best known as a TV and radio personality, first at the CBC for over 20 years, and then at Jazz FM with his morning show, Ben Mergi in the Morning. Born in Tangiers, Morocco, Ralph arrived in Canada with his family in the late 50s and settled in Toronto. Ralph has had a very eclectic career, stand-up comic, singer in a band, national media member, then in government communications. He's executive advisor to the president at Sheridan College, and along the way has sought out and become an ordained spiritual director. And Sean Hitchens is the author of a new book, The Light Streamed Beneath It, and a brief history of oversharing, which came out several years ago. His one-man show, Ginger Nation, toured extensively before being filmed in concert. Hitchens is an award-winning entertainer, writer, personality and creator of live performance, some of which we'll see today. And based in Toronto, Ontario, Sean splits his time between Eastern and Pacific time zones. Welcome to all of you and congratulations on your wonderful books. I think um, we should talk a bit about how you came to write your book and maybe you could take that to explain what it is. Uh, these books are just landing and we do encourage you to buy them. There'll be information about that later. Who wants to go first? Hmm. Sean, yours is just out. Why don't you start? Oh, okay. Uh, so my book uh, is very different than uh, Oversharing. Um, this one, uh, you know, I've written for uh, for money. I've written for uh, <laughs> uh, social clout. I've written because someone's like, hey, here's an opportunity. And this is the first time that I actually had to write myself out of uh, an experience. Um, so I was felt very lucky that I had like a process of writing to deal with uh, the sudden loss of two, uh, two men in my life. And uh, yeah, 
Uh, so it's a very, this book is very, very different as it comes out because uh, it has a, has a different meaning to me because it's not, it's not a, so much about my career or entertaining people. It's about having a discussion about grief and, uh, and aliveness. So I'm absolutely terrified as it trickles out into the world. <laughs> Good. We'll talk more about that later. Um, making ourselves yeah. vulnerable and coming to terms with grief is a theme I think comes up in all of your books to some degree. Catherine, your very funny book was prompted by the breakup of a relationship and some other things. Do you want to talk about how you decided to turn that into a book and, and what prompted it? Yeah, my book, The Bright Side, is about a single year, 2015. And... Um, you know, taken one by one, the events of the year happened to pretty much everybody. Both of my parents died. They were in their 90s, so it wasn't tragic, but it was big events. Um, my divorce came through. My house fell apart. Promising new man turned out to be not so promising. Um, and I, I carried the idea of this year around in my head for quite a while. And um, when I uh, pitched it, uh, the first response from uh, the publisher was, no. <laughs> but, uh, I really felt I had something there and so I, I, I went back at it and um, I had a lot of uh, re huge reservations myself because A, I've been a lifelong editor, not a writer, um, and B, they were ordinary. Like I, I wasn't raised by wolves or uneducated and locked in the basement or anything like that. Like I was, these are ordinary events. And, and I thought, you know, why would anyone want to read that? And then I just flipped it on its head and I thought, okay, well, these are ordinary events. They happen to all of us. So maybe people are interested. I remember um, Lydia Davis said, um, I'm not something like I'm not interested in the sensational, but the oft repeated ordinary. And it turned out that that's kind of where I'd find my voice with this book. Yeah, I want that's that's a good question. Um, we'll we'll come back to to the idea of whether this is cathartic for you. But uh, Ralph, first of all, let's start with you had a literal wake up call that started your book. You you were within hours of, of a heart attack, and that seems to have prompted this this journey. Do you want to talk about what's in it and what you cover? Sure. Um, first, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm not somebody who writes books for a living, but. I did this one and it's, I have no idea what's going on in terms of doing it. Uh, it's called, I Thought He Was Dead. Uh, and uh, what prompted, you know, what I start the book with was a, a moment of walking outside in the winter and just mm, a catch in my chest, a catch in my breath and thinking, oh, what is that? That, that doesn't feel so good. Uh, and then finding out that I had angina and I had to have stents put in and, uh, you know, I thought, okay, well, that, that that was a bit of a tap on the shoulder. You know, it's like when you you have a bad uh, flu or something and you're lying in bed and there's just this moment where you feel like death just literally gives you a little tap and goes, I'm over here. You know, <laughs> how's it going? Um, so that was a bit of a wake up. And then a, a year later, uh, I had uh, cancer. So that was more of a wake up. Um you know, the thing about talking about these things is I, I'm very private in, in most of my life. I don't talk about my, my personal life. I don't show pictures of my family on social media. I don't do that stuff. Um, but there was something in this. Uh, it's a spiritual memoir. And there was something in this that I wanted to really deal with with people about the idea of um, this is not a rehearsal. This is it. Mm. And if you don't value it, at that level, then it, it just sort of dribbles by. And I think the book is an exploration of that. It's also an exploration in terms of grief of, there are certain career griefs that people have. And I've certainly had them and um, that, you know, it, it, in our line, my line of business, it was, you know, uh, get me Ralph Ben, who's Ralph Ben Murgy, get me Ralph Ben Murgy, get me a young Ralph Ben Murgy, who's Ralph Ben Murgy. Right. That's kind of the way it works. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to also let go of ego of what you were and what you think you are now. So I, I wanted to explore that in an honest way. So that's well, basically what it was about. A lot of these mm -hmm. books are about letting go of the lives we thought we had, that we were, mm -hmm. the paths that we were on. I have a question because you, you are, you've worked in different formats, all of you. Why was a book the right way to tell the story? 
Um, Catherine, especially you've been an editor and uh, Catherine was my editor um, early in my career. And I had you always written or was it just this is the this is the time and place? No, well, picking up on what Ralph just said, um, one of the chapters in my book is about being fired seven times and, and you know, in my the favorite media, part. <laughs> yeah, the actually, actually read that in Walrus. Um, and in the world that a lot of us come from, that's just how things are. And after uh, one of those firings, the most painful actually from the Globe and Mail, um, I started to write. I was about 50 then. And but really, uh, kind of secret, you know, in my drawer writing. And um, then I just kind of what you just said, Ralph. This story just wanted to be expressed, and and it wasn't immediate. I really did walk around with it um, for a few years um, before it just felt like it had to come out. I I did start to write for the Star and. And aspects of it came out, but I kept realizing that there was something, something there that I needed to say. And I think I don't, it's a bit woo-woo, but I'd love to hear what you guys think. Um, the story knows what form it wants to take, right? It knows that it's not an article or a poem or a or a play, but in this case, for all of us, I think a personal memoir. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How does it feel to be the story instead of reporting on the story? Ralph and Catherine, both of you can maybe speak to that a bit. Well, you know, one of the things for me was um, uh, in Canadian media, what you in showbiz, uh, what you realize is there's absolutely no leverage, no marquee. <laughs> <laughs> you just sit there. Uh, and what I learned early on was to put my name on everything. You know, Friday night with Ralph Ben Murgy, Ben Murgy live, Ben Murgy in the morning, uh, because without it, you can't say the extra thing that the Americans say all the time, which is, but it's me, right? Yeah. Because they're like, whatever, who's you? Like, uh, yeah. I, I asked somebody who's the uh, star of, um, um, uh, see, I can't even remember. Uh, um, well, anyway, I asked them who was the star of a, a show that's been on for 9,000 years at this point, and... Uh, Murdoch Mysteries. And uh, I said, who is it? And now that show, I think, is in its 15th year. Mm -hmm. And they had no clue. And they were in the business. So Yannick, no. So it was just crazy, right? So uh, yeah. that, that's the way the, these things go. Uh, Yannick Bissett. So that's the way these yeah. things go. Um, but for me, I, I think that doing this, uh, in years after I'd sort of gotten to Friday night and this, you know, sort of, drive into a bridge abutment at a hundred miles an hour kind of moment. Um, I didn't want to be the one, but I did a series of uh, documentary series on Israel uh, for vision TV. And uh, I said to them in the pitch, I don't, I, I wanted to just be the voices of people in Israel. And they were like, no, oh, it's gotta be your story as a Moroccan Jewish guy in Israel. And I was like, okay, I guess so. So, you know, it, there's phases you go through as to why you are in the center of a story and why not. And in memoir, I, I, I think it's a meditation for me. I think that mm -hmm. uh, um, I've spent about the last seven years in spiritual guidance with people and uh, as an ordained spiritual director. And that work sort of got me to a point where I thought, I, I really want to talk about this. Once it wasn't like, you know, how am I doing? then it was more interesting to me to write it. I want to talk to all of you about the process of writing about experience, um, something you've lived. Sean, your book is structured mm -hmm. around letting go of two men that were very significant in your life. This doesn't mm -hmm. give anything away. It's, it's in it's the summary. In the, yeah, it's in the copy. <laughs> um, but in order to write for a reader what your experience was, you had to basically relive moments in hospital rooms and empty apartments. And yeah. how did it feel? to just be there again? Um, so I I didn't think I would start losing my mind. Like I think artists uh, sort of dream of, of how they're going to lose their mind. Uh, I didn't know that my relationship to time and space in my body with post-traumatic stress would actually, um, that's how I would start experiencing where I was starting to slip. Um, so, 
I read this book called The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. And he said the first, the hardest thing it is for anyone suffering from post-traumatic stress is to put things in order. Um, you know, uh, the timeline gets all messed up. So I, I sat with a piece of paper and um, multiple pads of paper, yellow legal pads, and line by line, I had to like say this happened and then this happened, but it was all jumbled up. And so I would take those pieces and cut them up. And then, um, and for, oh, sorry, Siri is speaking to me right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I had to cut them up and I had to line them on the floor. So, you know, something what, that happened in uh, Los Angeles was mixed up with something that happened in New Brunswick, something that happened in San Francisco was, I, I was all over the place. And so that moment by moment piece is actually me stitching time together so that I had a cohesive, I can look at the book and say, this is what happened. And it was actually how I started to heal my post-traumatic stress. And uh, I don't know why anybody wants to, um, time travel, it's absolutely terrifying. Don't do it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you know, that that's what this book is for me. It's uh, and why I take people into into those spaces. You know, I look over here, I look over there, I look over there, it is it's a process of of sewing myself together. So narrative, um, the writer Andrew Solomon, mm -hmm. I think it was on mm -hmm. CDC ideas. I've always remembered this, and if it's the wrong quote, I'm sorry, said, people think that it's cathartic to write about depression. It is not. Um, I'm hearing a bit of feedback for some reason. Is, uh, is it, to answer that question, if it was cathartic, and I'll put myself on mute for a sec. Is that for Catherine? Catherine or Rolf, did you find it cathartic to write about your experiences? Go ahead, Catherine. Um, you, you know, I, as an editor, I also, uh, was very private. I was an editor for a reason. I did not want to be the center of the story at all, ever under any circumstances. Um, it was a very comfortable position for me to be in. And, uh, then all of a sudden I'm, I'm writing about myself and everything about myself, not just about myself, but about other people in my family. And, um, it turned out that I was completely comfortable with that. Like, I, I do think you do go through phases and it sounds like each of us had an event that, that compelled us to go inside and, and then express that. And um, I, I was, once I started to write, I was astonished uh, by my complete lack of concern about revealing any detail Mm. just just gone somehow and I, I still feel that way I'm not sure my family does <laughs> <laughs> it sort of comes across in your approach to life like in the book um even in that part about how you've been seven times fired or let go from jobs you just shake it off and you're like well this happened to me here's what we can all learn from it that's a, a rare skill like where do you think yeah. you got that from well it wasn't like that at the time you know, when I got fired from the Globe, I, I really kind of went to bed for a few months. It was, mm. it, well, these things are rough from the time, but that's part of speaking of humor. You know, you start to, you know, with a little bit of perspective, see the funny side. I, I'm lucky. I come from a uh, resilient family. My father, who's a character throughout the book, is an extraordinarily optimistic man who... Uh, believed that adaptability was the only way through life, especially through life as you get older, because things are going to happen, bad things, you know, they're going to pile up. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had a, I had both a, a I think a constitutional uh, ability or inherited ability or whatever that is, and, and a taught ability to rebound. Mm. So for me, I think the, um, there were several different things that prompted me to keep going in the book. <clears throat> the original impulse was that in the spiritual work I, I do uh, now, uh, I felt that there were things I wanted to say. Um, I, I feel like we live in, a, in an era where uh, God is dead and take care of that. 
um, we're God and we're really bad at it. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there was that I wanted to deal with. There was, uh, what is the workplace? You know, I have a little piece in the book where I say, you know, I've been to a lot of, you get an email, uh, join us at two o'clock for Fred's, uh, you know, goodbye pizza party. And you're a little peckish. <clears throat> so you go over there and give them a slap on the back at a certain point after a slice of pizza and say, hey, you keep in touch. Uh, and uh, you don't because it was proximity that made friendship. And I said, what would happen if we made a circle and you took four or five people you had worked with in this place? And each of them had a, a, an artifact and an anecdote about who you are and what you've meant to them. And then you get to get up and thank them and say goodbye in a meaningful way. But instead, we're so terrified of each other that we actually march people out of buildings. Mm -hmm. Humiliation. That's what we give people at the last moment. I also talk about the idea that you're driving to work and you're listening to, uh, you know, uh, Hart's version of uh, Stairway to Heaven. And, you know, dun, 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 you're into it, right? Like you're into it. And you get to the parking lot and you stop and turn everything off. And then you sort of look at yourself and say, look, you stay in here. I'm going into work because you don't give all of yourself to what you do. So for me, you know, I'm 65 years old now and it's not a rehearsal. So there are those things I want to be able to talk about with people and say, let's bring something more meaningful. You know, spirituality is a relationship issue. Mm -hmm. Religion's a fitness program. You can choose one or not, but it's sort of, if you do this, if you want a six pack, you kind of have to work out. Uh, but spirituality, we all have it. It's just a question of how do we connect the dots to actually have it in our lives. So those things really pushed me. And then my publishers at Woolsack went and when Noel said, there's not enough you in here. Because I had mm -hmm. really learned to stay in the background and be an advisor to people. And she said, you got to, so 75,000 words had to be put in about my life and career. Mm -hmm. And I, that I found kind of harder to do than the other part. But interesting in the end. And I thought, well, there's a journey in here and every one of us has it. You know, Catherine talking mm -hmm. about being fired. We've all been fired. It's a dirty secret. So, you know, mm -hmm. have somebody talk about it. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting that you say being marched out because of course that is, it's so inhumane. And I, I have thought a lot about that because I'm close to the end of my working career. I, Choice, I hope this time. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I thought, you know, I'm going to throw myself a party. Like I'm going to throw myself a Bilbo Baggins style fireworks oh. party. That's just going to have everyone I ever worked with, all the places that I, I never got the chance to properly say goodbye to people and make it a respectful and a joyous event as opposed to a tragic event. So I think you can seize ownership of the narrative sometimes at least mm -hmm. i hope so hmm. do you write for yourself or for someone else for the audience anyone can take that uh i write for myself but i always write with the audience in mind i'm always in a conversation with somebody uh because that's I, my career started in cabaret uh, well, and stand up and a drag queen for a while. I mean, I was all over the map in my twenties. I don't really remember them. Uh, they were great. Uh, <laughs> uh, but cabaret is not just some person's, uh, standing on stage. It's a conversation. So in every, the first book oversharing was about trying to get, um, trying to take that conversation into a book form. And this one is just a full conversation. You, me, sitting together, and let's talk about it. I don't so. write for I don't write for uh, an audience. I remember when I was working at the CBC, um, there was this time where what crept into our conversations about the next show was that all of a sudden somebody from marketing was in the room. Mm. I've worked in public broadcasting my in my broadcasting life my whole life I have absolutely no interest in 16 minutes past the hour you know I, I'm just not that guy God love them all I have friends who do it it's great but it's not me and they would say well you know what's the demographic of the show we were trying to develop and they'd say I don't know what do I care with like what like it, what are we trying to say 
Mm. Why are we doing this? What, you know, what does it mean to us to do this? And can we do it in a way where people will watch if they're eight or 80? What do I care? Mm. So when I, when I was writing this, it was kind of like when uh, you're writing comedy, um, you really have no idea if it's funny or not, unless there's somebody else in the room. And in this instance, there was no one else in the room. And I didn't want my wife to read it. I didn't want anyone to read it because I just thought, you're going to screw up my head. I'm going to start second guessing myself. I'm just going to keep writing. But I've always felt that you're trying to articulate your voice, and that takes a lifetime. So if you can get there, great. But if you're thinking, will they like it? Like when they sent the book out for endorsements, and some people very kindly sent nice endorsements back, I was like, oh, a Sally Field moment. <laughs> you know? mm. You like me, you know, it was great. I had a lot of fun with that, but I didn't do it for them, right? Mm -hmm. Anyone scared when they're, when they're book to, for their book to hit the world? Yeah. <laughs> what scares you, Sean? Uh, what scares me? Um, I think what scares me about this book is for the first time, I'm not writing for everyone, right? right? I'm not, it's not entertainment. Um, if one person doesn't like it, I'm actually okay with it this time <laughs> uh, because it's not for everyone. Uh, and I think a book finds you in a moment and you pick up that book and I'm writing for that one person who needs to hear, just keep going. You know, no feeling is final. Uh, just, you know, um, that's the person I'm writing to. There's very much a sense in your book that you're writing a guide to grief for others. And I, yeah. I hugged my boyfriend last night for no reason. And he said, why are you hugging me? And I said, I'm reading this really sad book. And I'm just so glad you're not dead. <laughs> 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 like you changed one, one person, one household. <laughs> um, it wasn't getting a dog. Uh, yeah, uh, right? <laughs> you know, I, I had moments of absolute terror, like just terror uh, writing it. I don't know if you guys had that. I'd never written a book, so I didn't know if I could write a book. And, and that was hovering over me uh, often. And I, I do remember about the third chapter. I couldn't write the third chapter, which isn't the third chapter now, but I just couldn't do it. I did draft after draft after draft after draft. And I finally showed it to my editor. And she said, uh, this is my 30th draft, I think. And she said, good first draft. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so that's a promising new man. Yeah, I went to bed honestly for the rest of the day. Oh. So there were real moments of just mm. panic, like panic. That I couldn't do it. So for oh, readers, yeah. that's the chapter where Catherine's gone through lots of stuff and a promising new man enters her life. Mm. Why was that a hard chapter? That seemed pretty universal. Like because I think I disliked him so much. I I I, I think that it's very hard to write about people you don't love. I, I think that's a real challenge. And by the time I was writing this, I, I didn't love him anymore. And uh, uh, there, a kind of revenge kept creeping into the <coughs> writing. And um, I realized that I, I had to find my own stakes in that relationship, which were big. Um, and when I finally made myself vulnerable to the, what had happened and how I had been rejected. This was a guy who came on just like a, a ton of bricks, like just, you know, pursued me madly, madly. And, and then at the precise moment when, when we had made a commitment and we're going to go traveling together, he uh, disappeared to the ghost mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, I had, I had a, a lot of, uh, resentment toward that but that doesn't work on the page you can't you can't uh, mm -hmm. take it out on somebody so when i finally mm -hmm. reminded myself of why i fell in love and and the things that, that made him appealing in the beginning i was able to get it get it down mm -hmm. these books deal with all the big things like there's there's breakups there's loss of jobs there's sickness there's literal death and the the fear of mortality is anyone surprised that this is a panel about humor? <laughs> it's called. <laughs> didn't didn't I call it a death panel on Twitter? <laughs> like a, or a literary death panel. Global's got it. Yeah, no, no. 
I mean, look, uh, I, I'm sure Sean shares this with me as people who have to make people laugh. Um, when you're a kid uh, in this kind of persona, uh, you take the, the, the things that are the most painful mm. and you take them to the playground and you make your friends laugh because mm. you have currency at that point because everybody likes somebody who can make you laugh. Um, in high school, I think I said this in the book, in high school, uh, in the last year, you know, we were writing this school yearbook. And mine was, I'm sick of being the class clown. You run out of jokes after a while. Mm -hmm. Because I'd gotten to this point where that no longer served me as a person. And yet, I went into stand-up after that because it's also a craft. I mean, funny's funny, and it's a beautiful world to live in. And stand-up, to be in, in, in the yuck yucks world that I grew up in in my early 20s, is a wonderful thing. I mean, every, like when Norm MacDonald uh, died uh, a week or so ago, you know, Norm was part of that group. We don't mm -hmm. see, you know, you don't look at Howie Mandel and think, oh my God, it's, it's like, yeah, no, we all sat on top of the freezer in the back before we went on stage and did our thing. So there's a sweetness to, to sorrow as well, too. I mean, um, sometimes it's the most alive you feel, right? Mm -hmm. Sadness and the, and the grief are the things that let you know you're you're actually here and you care enough mm. to really hurt. Um, the the key for me has been to allow uh, to be available to what's actually present in my life and not run to Plan B, which is I'm going to make this hilarious, and just sort of stay with it and stay with people who I, I counsel in spiritual direction to stay with what they're what they're feeling to be present, you know, mm. to, to what is. So, and the other thing for, for me, by the way, in, in this book, it, it's, it's, an, um, it's a personal ambiguous grief, and that is aging. I, I spoke a fair bit about aging in this book because I think ageism is the last acceptableism. You know, um, I talk about the fact that 5% of people in uh, movies and television series are over 65. And of those 5%, they're decrepit, they're incontinent. They're incompetent. They're inappropriate. Uh, they're all these things. They're the punchline. They're not the story. Mm -hmm. And I, I really uh, found myself grieving about getting older and thinking, I, I've got to do something about this. I've got to write, say something, you know. And, and writing, by the way, for me, I always wrote for to say it out loud. Mm -hmm. It was the broadcast. It's a totally different writing. I don't even know where the commas go because they don't matter when you're talking broadcast. You're just like, if you put a comma, it's just to tell yourself that you should go. And I think mm -hmm. that that's the kind of thing that that's what you're doing, right? Because you're giving yourself a cue for how to say what you're saying. So to actually write right was intimidating. I was like, oh, I'm not one of them writer people. So it was fun to blow through that and have Noel kind of hold my hand and go, you're fine, you're writing well. Don't worry about it, keep going, right? Something was driving you to get that out. Yeah. Was us, it sounds that way, you know, like you can, you can carry grief, you know, in a breast pocket and be a wounded person walking around, or you can know that you're not alone. I mean, conquering our feeling of separateness is the point of the exercise, right? That you, somebody comes up to Sean and says, Hey man, I read your thing and you know, I lost like someone I truly loved and it just really helped me. Or Jessica decides to hug her husband or her boyfriend for no apparent reason. And apparently you don't do this a lot. <laughs> it surprised me. Hey, what Um I I wondered, do you all know you're funny? Like you're like, I just described the most terrible tragic event of my life, which I think is literally accurate in these cases, and people are like, humor. <laughs> like <laughs> Uh, or, or do you do you think they're just so intertwined that we can't um, separate them? Uh, it's inseparable for me. Um, I, I mean, I wouldn't. I can say this after much therapy that I wouldn't be alive if I lost my sense of humor. If I didn't lose my sense of self awareness in in the situations that I was in, um, because even in the darkest moments, it was there were moments of just. Uh, absurdity. I think that's when you lean into sort of Beckett and uh, <laughs> waiting for Godot moments. Um, so yeah, and 
that's always just been my way of breaking tension. You make up so, little words like in the book uh, within days or, or a short time, you're marking the first Christmas after the loss of yeah. that. And you yeah. put up what you call grief mystery. A grief like, mystery. Oh, grief, grief mystery. mystery. And then when, yeah. I think it's in, when you're in California and you're not taking selfies, you're taking griefies. Hey, griefies. <laughs> <laughs> I know because it was just abs like an absurd moment of like, I'm running up, I'm, well, I'm walking up Runyon Canyon and just absolutely just rob. But the wonderful thing was people were looking at me in those moments just after David had died that week before I flew back up to San Francisco to start dealing with his estate with his sister and his um and his friend Lauren. And people were looking at me like, oh, I know, I didn't get that part too. Because <laughs> <laughs> that was the surprising thing about Los Angeles is that it actually has a a lot of capacity for people who are just wounding. Uh, and so, yeah, take a griefy and just be like, here it is. I'm absolutely sad in this beautiful location. <laughs> yeah, griefies. When my, when my mom died, um, she was 92 and she was in the palliative care at St. Mike's Hospital. And we'd all, she was about two weeks in the actual process of death. And in the moment that she died, we all gathered and we were starving, you know, grief makes you hungry, right? And and so we went down to Tim Hortons and got tuna salad sandwiches and we sat around and passed the sandwiches around and chatted and her body was lying there and and it felt completely normal. And I put that in the book and it was really surprising to me the number of people who said that they did something almost exactly the same, like somebody, now it, it's not, these are people in their 90s, so it wasn't tragic in the way that I think it would have been with mm. your friends but it, the the humor and and the sweetness really I think that was the reason we stayed in the room for so long was that there was something a very beautiful and sweet about her death and uh, most of us were really able to kind of hold that I, mm -hmm. I talked to a youngie and he often talks about holding something mm -hmm. say you're talking about being present Ralph you know see if you can hold on to that and, and mm -hmm. stay with it and um, I do know people who've experienced a uh, death of parents, say, who have found the whole experience just horrific, like awful, and, and something they don't want to think about and can't mm. face. And um, I'm glad it wasn't like that for me because it, mm. it, it was really profound to be part of it. I, felt, I feel fortunate. Mm. Can I just add something to that for, for a second? Um, so in the book, I talk about, um, I mean, it's called I Thought He Was Dead. So, you know, but that's more about people seeing you if you've not been in public for 10 years and you can see on their faces thinking, well, I thought he was dead. <laughs> so you just have to accept that. Uh, but I write about my dad um, who died at 68 uh, after three years of dealing with strokes. It died, his first massive stroke was three days before his actual retirement. The bags were packed for a trip to uh, Caracas to see my uh, relatives in Venezuela. And then three years of just slowly dying. Um, but when I went in that room, uh, I'd never seen a dead body before. I'd never seen someone dead. And we're very, very death phobic. I, I refer to Stephen Jenkinson's book, Die Wise, several times in the book because he has great wisdom about dying. But I was in there in a warm and cold body. I mean, there were parts of them that were warm, parts were cold. But the one thing I did know, looking at, at his milky eyes at that moment, it had been about two hours since he died before I got there, was that he wasn't there anymore. Mm. I, it was the first time I could really feel, and I, you know, it's not an argument for, that I have with people, it's just how I felt and feel that there is a soul and it goes. And that was really a profound thing for me. And in those moments, you know, I, I think when Sean was talking about griefies, um, for me, that's what we do later to make it funny. Mm. But when we're in it, if you're not able to feel it, really feel it, then you probably won't be really funny about it later either mm. <laughs> because you're not really connected to it because – uh, you know, most of the people I, I, I grew up with in comedy in that part of my life, um, they had a lot of pain. You know, at parties, they were the worst. 
right? They just sort of stood there like social cripples and said inappropriate things all night, right? They just weren't there connected. But what I yearned for as my I got older was, you know, if I was going to go and do a thing for a you know rubber chicken event of some kind, um, is I didn't want to be funny. You know, do you know, talk for 40 minutes, be funny. Well, first of all, that's absurd. <laughs> but secondly, I just thought I don't always need to be funny or want to be funny. And I write in the book about when I was doing a big variety show that I was actually thinking, what am I doing here? Like, this isn't really me. And I had to sit with that and then go be funny. So they don't necessarily grow out of each other. They're just different parts of us that we access at different moments, I think. I think a theme in your book um, that I picked up on is a, a journey to authenticity. You, you've done stand-up. It's on your CV. And, Sean, you've got professional performance all over your, your background. Mm -hmm. Is there something about comedy that's different than this, than this, this writing, which is about um, authenticity or something else? Uh Okay, so for me, comedy was a way of constantly, because I also deal with uh, a little bit of my childhood in my book. And so comedy became this, um, this pattern of saying, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening. Um, which is not healthy. You know, I went into therapy, like terrified that it would ruin my comedy career. And it did. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm alive. Uh, why, why so, is that? You can't be funny and know yourself? Well, it's the, it's the reason why you're telling. Yeah, it's right? a that, a that's that it, it, it switches how you are that the driving force, the engine. Um, it, it ruined my career in that sense, but it's actually made me, I have art, like I have creative hygiene now. That's what I call it, creative hygiene. I'm able to manage my talents. Uh, if I go on stage and I have a great set, I'm not up until four or five in the morning with the adrenaline. Hmm. Uh, so I'm able to be more flexible. Um, and I'm not writing to figure stuff out anymore. I'm actually just, with this book, it's like, this happened. Not this is happening, this happened. Um, which is very different. Uh, and this book can only exist, like my story right now can only exist as a book from a queer angle because queer transformation stories don't exist. Uh, we have our coming out stories that we, you know, happens to us at 17, 18. Sometimes they're great. Sometimes your coming out stories are amazing. My parents love me. Uh, sometimes they're not. And that those stories we carry way, way too long into adulthood. And the only other transformation story that's actually uh, present are, you know, drag, drag races. You know, RuPaul's Drag Race is, the, is in the ether. Uh, so this book right now can only exist as a queer transformation story. And I don't think we're a visual representation of what happened to me. The fact that I openly say I believe in God now, you know, would not say that as an atheist, uh, what I call myself an atheist with a Christmas tree. Uh, yeah, gosh, I went off there, but. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I, I think we can say all of the books deal in the in a different way with archetypes. So, Sean, in your book, you talk about trying to grieve without necessarily a mode for what do you do. You have a role. You're you're the ex wife, the first wife in the hospital with mm -hmm. Matt, and then later yeah. um, with David, yeah, you're recast as the boyfriend, and there's a different first right. wife. And yeah. so you're creating your own templates for relationships. But I think that's yeah. something I see Catherine, you do and Ralph, you do too. You're, you're looking for templates for modern divorce hood <laughs> or modern masculinity. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm right about that, but you can jump in if you want. Hmm. Yeah, I think uh, what we've 
don't really embrace in the queer community. We queer spend so much time uh, comparing our relationships, right? It's not just this is my husband. It's uh, this is sort of my husband who's like this, or this is uh, this is my fake father. This is my so we're always putting so much distance between ourselves to um, equate our relationships to heteronormative, uh, sort of like. Um, I don't know what you want to call them, titles. Um, when death enters the picture, that's blown apart. And we don't have that structure. We don't have that architecture to, to put ourselves onto and just sit in and say, this is who this person was to me, or this is this. Is this. Can I pop and, something in here for a second? Just yeah. because I'm going to forget it. <laughs> the only reason. Um, so we just, uh, in the Jewish uh, faith, we just went through the high holidays and uh, mm. the, the days of awe and uh, Yom Kippur, which is a, a day of atonement and fasting, but it's also a rehearsal of death. Mm. You, you're, you're supposed to dress in white and you get a white, when you die, you get mm. a white shroud that you're put in and then you're put either directly into the ground or in a pine box and see you later. Um, but that's, that's all rehearsal. Uh, the, the book of mm -hmm. life, death. And one of the interesting things about death is uh, we send, tend to think of it often as the most final of physical acts. But in reality, when I hear Catherine say, I got fired seven times, she died seven times. Mm -hmm. Those are seven deaths. You know, it's not just the death of people that, that transforms us. It's, it's that things uh, uh, emerge, uh, arise, die. That, that is life. You know, mm. when I talk about God in, in the book, I talk about not, uh, you know, um, a guy with a beard on the throne with a naughty and nice list. That's, that's Santa Claus. You know, I'm talking about a verb, an actual flow of creation that we're a part of. You know, Jenkinson says uh, the human lifespan is not life. It is just the human moment in the flow of life. So those kinds of things for me became really interesting stuff. Are they funny? No. Um, does everything need to be funny for me anymore? Absolutely not. But can I use funny to really help somebody heal? Yeah. I can be in a room with somebody and I, I've, you know, over the years, I, I've just, funny is part of my DNA and I can know to use it at that moment, not just to break tension, but sometimes just to, to just move someone's mood into a different place I was just sitting with someone whose who's wife after 60 years has, has died. And, you know, he, he was overwhelmed and occasionally wanted to cry. But at the same time, and that evening, uh, we ended up singing together uh, Moon River. Yeah. Because he used to be a singer, you know, years ago. And he just lit up, you know. It was beautiful. My you were about to sing it. Huh? You were about to sing it. Well, no, it's just my huckleberry, and he's just right in it, and he's smiling. And then we have his old, we have his old pinball machine in our garage. So I said, "Come, let's play some pinball." And he's laughing and yelling, and oh, damn, I missed that one. And I thought that that's the beauty of funny, is you can use it when you when you can help other people with it. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. you can be inappropriate, but that's part of funny too, right? I think I had an, a, a different arc with funny because I, I what, never really thought of myself as funny, you know, maybe amusing, but I, I know very funny people and, and I would put myself at about, you know, 10th in the funniness spectrum of my social circle. So I, I was, I, I think I found a funny voice in my writing that I hadn't really known mm. was there. So that different, different arc. Mm. Of you. Mm. How'd you find that? Well, I think partly because um, I had to, because um, things had been very hard. And it was, as you say, Ralph, it wasn't in the moment funny. It's not like you're laughing your head off when your mother's just died. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or when you get fired or anything, somebody rejects you. Um, but uh, yeah, humor was a way to give it a perspective and to 
to kind of look at it from all angles without self-indulgence. Um, I guess that's... We have about 10 minutes left. This has flown by. So I'd like to ask a bit about how you wrote your books, because I think it's really interesting how different um, writers put their work together. How did you know the scope of your story? Did you sort of like, Sean, you've mentioned that you had to piece yours together um, through PTSD, mm -hmm. but I wondered, did the form of your book, um, Catherine, maybe you can take this one, just come to you? Or did you have to say, this is the beginning and this is the end, and I'm, I'm going to write it all like uh, that? I do have a story of a year, so that's handy. Right. Mm -hmm. um, although I resisted the chronology of the year um, in the writing, um, I, I, I really didn't want it to be strictly chronological, which made it kind of confusing. And a, a young editor, uh, kind of an editorial assistant, read the first uh, several chapters, and she said, "I don't know, like maybe just follow the chronology." And I remember being so <laughs> furious, like just, follow the chronology. What do you know? <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, she was right, of course. I mean, you don't utterly follow the chronology because that's not how the mind works. You you go forwards and backwards as we the same way we think and feel things. So I, I of course, did that. But um, I decided ultimately that chronology, especially for a first book, was an extremely useful tool for, for me. Mm -hmm. And and when I surrendered to it and used it as... Um, not a crutch, but uh, something very stable that that helped me. Mm -hmm. Ralph, yours looks sort of more at your career over a long, um, pull, pulling in and out, I would say. That came after, you know, the original idea was, when I think of something, if I can write, these are the eight chapters or 10 chapters of the book. This I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do, you know, because I come from cue cards on a wall to create a show. So you, mm -hmm. you just, you know, what what segment goes after this segment? You know, what do you go to break? What's the next segment or a radio show? And so I tend to think if I can't, if, if an idea doesn't make me think, I've got a lot to say in, in, a, in, a, in an order. But I also am very open to letting go Mm -hmm. uh, of what I think I know. It's like when you pitch a documentary series and the producer's like, uh, we'd like the uh, the breakdown. It's like, are you nuts? Like, once you get there, it's it's nothing like what you thought it was, and you got to be aware of what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I'm always open to whatever can change. Um, this, the only skill I brought to this is that I can write a lot, mm -hmm. that I can do a 1,000 words a day or 1,500 words a day, and, and that they're not awful. So that helps because that, that, you know, what the hell, I have to now go back and do them again. So there's something I can do. Like if I have to write 750 word op-ed about something, it's about two hours. Mm -hmm. What I'm bad at is one of the things Catherine's good at, which is I'm an ADD guy. So details just kill me. And the first thing I said to my, uh, to, to Noel, my publisher at Woolsack and Wynn was, you're really going to have to make sure I don't look dumb here because uh, I, I, I miss details, little details all the time. I'm, I'm, I'm like, woohoo, 30,000 feet. So that was great. And I just, I have to say, I loved the process of writing the book. You know, it really was a part of my day every day. And I'd learned something from, what's that guy's name? Ian, Scottish guy who does crime. Thank you. Thank you. So, I had I interviewed him once on Jazz FM, and I said, "Do you have any tips for people?" And he said, um, "Never stop writing in a day at the end of thought or the end of a chapter. Stop in the middle of the thought, so that the next day when you go in and sit down, you're like, oh, and I'll carry on now." And that was the best piece of advice for me was that the next day I wasn't like, "Where am I going now?" It was like, "I'm still in the middle of something here. I'm just going to keep going." So that was great. Wow. That's um, good yeah, isn't it? One, one of the, I, I'm just popping off your 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 pieces of advice. Uh, I had a, uh, a psychologist friend. We went out for dinner during all of this grief. Uh, and he said, uh, you know, eventually you're gonna have to turn it off. You're gonna have to turn off your grief. And so 
I was like, that is so mean to say, why are you saying this to me? It's so like, it's so mean. That's so, I don't want to hear that right now. Uh, ended up being the best piece of advice. And that's how I knew where the ending of my book was in the decision to turn off, uh, off the grief. And that was on the Hill in San Francisco. So, uh, that's how I sort of framed, uh, I'm really bad at ending. So I just wrote a beginning. <laughs> so the end of my book is a beginning. So I started at the beginning, which is the ending. I know it sounds weird, bad relationship to time. Uh, and that's, and I just worked back from that. What is the moment? And, uh, what is the moment that I turn on aliveness? It shuts off and then turn on aliveness again. And that's how it framed the book. You talk about joy in that scene, the joy of the body, mm. of being here, of dancing. Yeah. Um, curious to know for others, what, <laughs> how do you get through it? <laughs> like, what keeps you going? What these are stories of resilience, and you know, where where do, where do you think you you get that from? Mm. I felt like I had to, um, you know, I'm a I'm a I won't go so far as to say I'm a bossy person, but I've often been a boss. And I'm used to kind of organizing everything and everyone. And I found uh, what this year taught me was that I needed to just sit still. I didn't really have, I didn't say to myself, oh, just slow down. I, I just had to. I had to become a bystander of my life instead of a manager of it. I, I had to just be curious and, and sit with the present, as Ralph said earlier. And uh, that was really how I got through it, actually. That was how I got through it, was, was stopping. So I have no idea. <laughs> like, I don't. I, like, I'll get, I, I've had, you know, like everybody, a few moments in life where the news wasn't good <clears throat> for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and in one way or another, personally, professionally, biologically. Um, but I give myself that day. And I don't even plan this, but I, I give myself that you just got punched in the face, right? And so take it and walk around with it. And very often the next day, for some reason that I can't explain, I see the sliver of light mm -hmm. and I just start walking towards it. And I just think, no, we're going to be okay. Let's just keep going. Mm -hmm. Or uh, I, I'm going to let this pop out of the bushes every once in a while and go, you are so screwed. And then just go, okay, let's walk together, shall we? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one of the things I've learned to do is to not try to kill these things in, in myself. Mm -hmm. Let them be companions to what I am as a person because they're real and they have an effect. So I think that's mm -hmm. the resilience. I don't know why I have it, um, but I'm very glad that I do. Mm -hmm. that's a, mm -hmm. Did you want to say something, Sean? Uh, uh, I think the only thing that I would add on to that is in terms of recovery, the only thing that I've learned, well, the, the not the only thing that I've learned, but the true thing that I've learned is that the goal of recovery is to rebuild a good life worth losing again. And, and accepting that as painful as it is, is what keeps me going. I live in memory of Matt. I live in honor of David. And I'm that the idea that I... I'm allowing myself to be vulnerable enough to lose it all again. That's what keeps me going. That's a beautiful note to end on. Thank you all for your generosity and openness mm -hmm. and your beautiful books. And I'm going to pass this back to Maya now for closing remarks. Yes, thank you very much, all of you, for your insights and your thoughtful conversation this afternoon on grief, resilience, writing, and yeah, the humor woven in and through the human experience of it all. So thank you all very much. It's just been a joy to listen to you uh, discuss. And uh, thank you to everyone tuning in from home. Uh, if you'd like to pick up a copy of The Light Streamed Beneath It by Sean Hitchens, The Bright Side by Catherine Bradbury, or I Thought He Was Dead by Ralph, Ralph ben Murgy, uh, you can find them at our virtual bookstore in partnership with Another Story Bookshop and our official ebook and audiobook seller, Rakuten Kobo. You have until tomorrow at the end of the festival to sign up for our giveaway in partnership with Rakuten Kobo. Visit toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca slash 2021-festival-contest for your chance to win one of three special prizes, including a new Kobo e-reader. 
Remember, for each day of the festival you tune into, you will receive a bonus entry code. Today's bonus entry code is Trickster. Make sure to tune in later this evening at 7 p.m. when we will be joined by Eden Robinson to discuss her newest book, Return of the Trickster, with Lisa Bird Wilson. Following that at 8, Andre Alexis will be here to chat about his new book, Ring, with Jose Teodoro. All information about our upcoming panels can be found on our website, toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca. If you'd like to support The Word on the Street by making a donation, simply head to our website and click Donate Now at the top of the homepage. Thanks again for joining us, and have a great afternoon.